Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to RTDology, Burns Engineering's online training series. I'm Jeff Wigan, National Sales Manager at Burns, and presenting today will be Bill Berquist, Senior Application Engineer. Today's presentation, RTD Accuracy and Associated Air Sources, is part of our continuing series of web-based training modules designed to help you better understand temperature measurement and achieve your measurement goals. If you've joined us for one of our previous sessions, we would like to welcome you back. If this is your first time with us, welcome. And when you get a chance, please check out our previous presentations on the RTDology page at burnsengineering.com. Today's session explores the topic of accuracy as related to temperature measurement with RTDs. Accuracy is an often confusing and misunderstood topic. In this session, we've attempted to simplify and present the key concepts and practical applications. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. To respect everyone's time, we'll make every effort to limit the presentation and Q&A period to one hour. We highly encourage questions, so please type them into the Q&A or chat box on your screen and send them to host and presenter. We'll attempt to answer as many as time allows. We'll provide a... Uh, um, uh, synopsis via email to all participants within a couple days. In addition, the session is being recorded and we will provide a link to all participants as soon as it's available. Uh, typically, that's somewhere between two and four days and we'll get to send an email out to you with notes for the session as well as a link to the uh, recording. If we don't get to your question or if you need some additional assistance, there will be contact information provided at the end of the presentation. And finally, our goal is to answer, answer your temperature measurement questions and challenges. We've put together our RTDology series with an eye to the most commonly asked questions and issues, but if you have a particular topic you'd like to have considered, please give us a call and we'll see what we can put together. So that covers the housekeeping. So without further delay, here's Bill Burquist to help point us in the right direction when it comes to RTD accuracy and associated air sources. Take it away, Bill. Hey, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I want to talk about um, some of the air sources with RTDs, and we're going to take a look at a typical application and, and look at how all these air sources play into the total overall measurement accuracy. And some of the things that I want want you to take away from the presentation today is that looking at just the RTD by itself is not the accuracy of that measurement. Um, there's a lot of different error sources that come into play and it's not only uh, with the sensor itself but it's also with the installation and um, we'll look at, at both of those and see how they affect it. Um, and then finally, there's the, uh, the two standards that govern most of the platinum resistance thermometers that are manufactured today. Uh, plays kind of a more of a minor role in that. Uh, so to do that, what I want to do is start out with uh, reviewing some terminology, and then we'll get into our, uh, our example application. We'll look at all the different error sources that are present in that particular application. Um, and then we'll talk about what we do with all of those error sources and how we end up with a measurement accuracy number. So then I think we can all agree that accuracy of temperature measurement in a process is really very important, not only from uh, efficient use of energy, but to produce a consistent product quality. Um, and then also in some industries we have third party uh, uh, watchdogs looking over your shoulder and they want to know that, that you're doing it correctly. First off, we look at a measurement that just tells us, um, kind of quantifies what, uh, uh, you know, how heavy, long, or hot. In our case, we're going to be looking at, you know, what is the temperature of that particular process. And we want to know how close that is to the actual value and then there's all these error sources that come into play and it's just the difference between the the uh, temperature measurement that we're trying to get and what the actual reading is <clears throat> and then there's always some uncertainty about that whole particular measurement and we can quantify that uncertainty and that uncertainty calculation does include um, uh, basically includes your confidence level in that particular measurement. So there are a couple different definitions of uncertainty. Uh, there's this really long one here, and it gets into uh, 
uh, talking about the the, uh, the guide for uncertainty and measurement. It's a work published by ISO. It has a lot of detail and it's very good. And if you need to know a lot of detail about uncertainty, it's a really good source. Um, it talks about the two types of uncertainty. We can use statistical methods or um, type B, which uh, as an example, you use uh, probability distributions and things to figure it out. But I'm not going to get into that kind of stuff in this presentation. Uh, that's, that's probably a, a whole multi-day class by itself. So I've, I've tried to simplify this a little bit. And I look at uncertainty of measurement. It's just the doubt that exists about the result of any measurement. So I mean, we need two numbers to do this. We, we need some kind of a tolerance associated with it, and then some confidence level. Uh, with those two things, the confidence level is a little subjective. Uh, and I'm going to show how the the, uh, the tolerance, we can actually apply some numbers and really quantify what that is. One of the sources that I really like for explaining measurement uncertainty is this A Beginner's Guide to Uncertainty of Measurement. And you can plug that into Google and it will uh, take you right to it. It's, it's a very easy read and a lot of good examples in there and hopefully the light bulb will go off and you know if you don't completely understand it, that will certainly help. I know it helped me a lot when I first started looking into this. Now there are a lot of different error sources with RTDs. Some are associated with the sensor, some with the installation, some with the instrumentation that they're connected to, and also the calibration that is done to the RTD. And we'll step through each one of these and, and look at those. There are some other sources, um, and, and these are really specific to the application. Uh, we, we won't really get into these too much in our, our sample application we chose. We don't have any of these types of things uh, coming into play, but th they can be a significant source of error. So we just used a uh, typical application here, of kind of a water-like fluid flowing in a pipeline, 20 feet per second. And we're trying to heat it up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have a temp sensor with a two and a half inch immersion. It uses a uh, thermal well and a platinum resistance thermometer. We have a transmitter located up here in the connection head. Um, ambient conditions, 20 degrees C. And we want to be able to control this process to plus or minus half a degree C. So we have a couple charts here, and we'll step through each one of these error sources and look at how the value is derived and where we get that information. And it's quite a few, so we've got a couple pages here. First off, interchangeability. Now, every RTD probe that is made is made to a specific tolerance, and the, the tolerances are defined by a couple of the standards, and they, they have a, uh, an R versus T, or resistance versus temperature uh, relationship with a tolerance associated with that. And we can, we can look at those in graphical form here. The two standards that are most commonly used are the ASTM and the IEC. And they, they have different categories of interchangeability tolerance specified by either a, a class A, or class B, or a grade A or grade B. And if we look at the chart here, right at uh, zero degrees C, that's the vertical axis here. Um, this is where the manufacturers adjust the resistance of the probe just as close as they can to 100 ohms at zero degrees C. So we're going to get our smallest interchangeability number here. And as we move away from zero degrees C, either in the negative direction or in the positive, that tolerance band gets larger. And we can pick numbers off of a graph like this, or we can use some equations to calculate that tolerance at any given temperature. 
in our equations here, the temperature T is in degrees C, and it's the absolute value. So if it's a negative temperature, you simply drop the negative sign. Going through each one of these, you can calculate the interchangeability tolerance at any usage temperature. For our example, we're at 65 degrees C. We plug that into the equation, and we have 0.523 degrees C, which we're trying to control to half a degree C. So we're already way over our, our, um, our budgeted tolerance, and we've only begun. Next up is insulation resistance. This can be typically a very small number, but I want to mention it here because it really is an important factor that comes into play of, of the accuracy of the sensor accuracy. It's one of the first things that should be checked with an RTD, either when it's received new or if it's been in service for a while. It's a good idea to check the insulation resistance. The, uh, the little platinum resistance um, sensor depends on having a very dry conditions around it and contaminant free. And if we get any contaminants or moisture in there, it causes shunting between the, the uh, coils of platinum wire and it causes a low resistance and a corresponding low temperature reading. Pretty simple test, just take a, a meg ohm meter connect one lead to the leads on the probe, and touch the other lead to the probe sheet. And now this number should be probably at least 200 meg ohms at room temperature. There, there's, you're going to see quite a few different numbers if you look at various manufacturer standards. Uh, there are several that use a test at 500 volts and 500 meg ohms as a minimum requirement. The two standards use much lower levels, and they're they're requiring about 100 meg ohms at, at room temperature. And the reason the tests are done at room temperature at such a high level is that as you go up in temperature with an RTD, the ability of the insulating materials inside to to isolate the, the electrical power decreases. So as you go up in temperature, the insulation resistance decreases. And if we have moisture in the probe, that resistance goes down. But what we really need um, as a minimum is, for most industrial applications, is about 10 meg ohms at whatever usage temperature you have, that's usually enough to minimize any error source. And if we, if we look at the actual um, uh, error value for, for like our, our conditions we have here, uh, it's going to be a very small number, just down on probably the hundreds or thousandths of a degree C. Things that uh, we look at that can cause this low insulation resistance, you know, I mentioned moisture getting inside the, the sheath or the, of the probe. That really is the biggest one. Um, other contaminants, pretty unusual to have that happen. Um, other things, if the probe does get damaged, it can get bent or banged around. That can cause low insulation resistance also. Um, Doing this test, really, it's, it's a really good, easy way to check, to, to make sure that uh, this probe is working correctly. And here I've got the 200 mega ohms. It's a pretty good uh, number. Tested at, uh, I think the, the specs both say that you use 50 volts DC, and it's got to be over 200 mega ohms at room temperature. If we run through the calculations there, we've got you know a whole bunch of zeros and a three, so it really, for our example, uh, I probably wouldn't even include this, but because it, it can be such a much bigger number for a probe that's been in service for a while, it's a good idea to check it to make sure that it is within the uh, acceptable values. 
instability or drift is the next thing to look at. This can be a fairly significant contributor for processes that run at a high temperature. From our little graph here, we can see if we're running at 500 degrees C and after about a thousand hours, uh, you know, we're up in the you know tenths of a degree C uh, change from our initial um, measurement. So that's a can be a pretty significant error source. Uh, in our example, we're down here uh, almost in the not even able to measure the drift, uh, 65 degrees C. I, probably a really small number. Um, we can we can take a guesstimate at it, or if the manufacturer has specifications for temperatures that low, we could use that number. Most of them are going to say, uh, you know, from 200 degrees C on up is where you get some significant drift. So I'm just going to plug in 0 0.01. This is a little bit of a, a guess, and if you wanted to be more certain or have a higher confidence level in this accuracy budget that we're calculating here, you could maybe pick a bigger number or maybe even use the 0 0.03 number that was used here for kind of an average drift after 1,000 hours. That, I, I think that would be overkill, but um, next up, repeatability. And now this is the, the, the temperature probe's ability to repeat a measurement over and over again uh, within a certain tolerance. It, it's never going to be perfect, uh, so there's always a, a tolerance associated with that, and the RTD manufacturers typically publish a number that relates to that. And again, this is a test according to this spec, was done from minus 200 to 500 C, which is a huge margin compared to what our process is running at 65 degrees C, and it's a steady state, so there's really no cycling. Um, I would expect there to be uh, a very small number associated with repeatability here. Um, in our example here, uh, we've got, uh, doing, the, doing the math here, 0.1 degrees C. And again, that's uh, probably a really conservative number. Some of the other components that come into play, thermal EMF, for example, uh, this is going to vary between the temperature probes. Some will have, uh, you know, because of the dissimilar metals that are used and connected together inside the probe, there's a potential to have um, some extra voltage produced. It's, it's very similar to what a, how a thermocouple temperature probe works. And it's, um, again, this is typically a really small number. Uh, there are some ways to calculate it, but um, for our, I'm going to bypass that because in our example, it's just a really small number. You know, I, I, it's about 0 0.03 degrees C. Again, that can be either calculated or you can pick that off of a manufacturer's specification. So, Jeff, I don't know if we've had any questions yet, but uh, if, you know, feel free to jump in here and uh, interrupt, and we can go ahead and answer those right now. Yeah, just a, just a reminder, uh, if you do have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box or the Q&A uh, section, and we'll go ahead and get you an answer uh, right away if we, if we can. Um, you know, some of this stuff gets, uh, gets a little deep, so if you have questions, you aren't understanding something, uh, by all means, ask a question. Okay. So next up here is hysteresis, uh, and this is again is another error source that's only going to come into play if our temperature in the process we're changing. When you take a temperature probe and heat it up and cool it down, right at the midpoint between that high and low temperature, the probe is not going to repeat the same number at the midpoint as it does going up in temperature as it does coming down, and that that difference right at the midpoint is kind of the maximum value of hysteresis. Um, so for our, for our uh, example here, we're at zero because we're, we're steady state, doesn't really apply. The next one, self-heating, that one does apply. Um, 
since a platinum resistance thermometer that we're using in our test here or in our example, uh, it's just a coil of platinum wire. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a resistor. We're running an electrical current through it, so it's going to heat up. And the amount that it heats up um, depends on a, a couple different things. One is going to be the, the application that it's put into. Like if we have water moving past this thing really quickly, so I'm going to expect that it's going to be pretty low. Um, most of the manufacturers will specify self-heating with a probe in water that's moving at three feet per second. In our example, our, our water was moving at 20 feet per second. So if we do the calculation using three, we can be assured that it's a very conservative number um, and it's going to more than include what we would actually see in our application. And here, running through the calculations, we end up with 0 0.007 degrees C. Again, another really small number, um, and, it, and it really depends on how certain you want to be about your error budget. Next up is time response, and this is time response is dependent on the the process we're looking at, but also how the probe is designed and what the uh, potting materials are and the type of sensing element that's used, whether there's a separable thermal well included with it. These things all affect time response. And time response can actually be a very large contributor to a measurement error. Now, if our process is running at steady state, we've got zero. And again, our process is at steady state. So I would expect time response not to be any kind of a contributor to it. Um, I have had, in fact, recently had a question from a customer about a, a process where they had a probe installed and it had about a, oh, probably an eight second time constant and they needed a replacement. And for them, it was extremely important that they replace the probe with one that had a time constant that was at least as good as what they already had. Their process was changing very quickly and they needed to control a, uh, a heater that would keep that temperature um, very steady right where, they, right where the previous probe would do it. And if you put in a temperature probe that's slower, it's gonna cause all kinds of problems and it's a very large error in your measurement. And we can look at a little graph here uh, just as an example. So if we, if we look at our actual process here on, on this line, um, and a couple different probe values, even the ones with a fast time response, you know, it's gonna lag behind. And our error at any given time here is this, this distance right here. And if we use a probe that's got a real slow time response, you know, we've got potentially quite a huge error. You're going to see manufacturers express time constant, and it's typically at three feet per second uh, moving water, and it's the amount of time for the sensor to uh, indicate a step change in temperature uh, of 63.2 percent. So if we were taking a probe from zero degrees C and putting it into 100 degrees C, the time it takes for it to read 62, 3.2 degrees uh, is the time constant. It, it's not the total time to, to measure that temperature. It's 63.2 percent. So it's a good indicator of how quickly the probe will respond and if, if you need to look at the full temperature measurement change, uh, you know, we would need to almost double that number. So if it's a, you know, five second time constant, you know, to get 90 something percent of that temperature change, you probably have to double it. So it, it's, it's really a good specification to use just to compare various temperature sensors. 
So in our little error budget table here, we're going to plug in zero because we're at steady state. So Bill, we got just a question on, on time response. So is it uh, is it always the case then that you want a uh, a faster time response is better um, from a, from an error perspective, or if your response time is too fast, can you run into some uh, some problems? You know, it actually works both ways. In in some applications, you know, you you really don't want to have a fast time response. An example there would be a well, an environmental chamber, like a, a freezer, refrigerator, maybe an incubator, where you may you might want to open up the uh, freezer to put product in or pull it out. And if you have a temp sensor that responds, you know, within a few seconds, it's going to set off an alarm and, and tell someone that the freezer door is open and they better go close it. In that case, you'd want a slow time response, one that is balanced so that you know that the product within the freezer is not getting colder than what it's supposed to. Um, and there are ways to do that. It can be done through the electronics or actually modifications to the temperature probe itself. The next error source is stem conduction. Uh, you may see this referred to as immersion error. And this can be one of the very significant and quite large ones. And, and, and this is caused by uh, typically insufficient immersion of the temp sensor into the process or a poorly designed uh, temperature probe. Um, and by poorly designed, I mean it's not suitable for that process, maybe uh, choosing, a, choosing a wrong style. Um, <coughs> So we have, in our example here, we've got uh, something flowing through this pipe at 200 degrees C, and we've got some ambient conditions out here of just 25. And so we get a lot of uh, cooling effect from the external portions of the temperature assembly. Uh, it acts much like a radiator on a car, for example. And if we get sufficient immersion, uh, that air source becomes um, you know, pretty much unmeasurable. But if we if we don't have sufficient immersion, it, it can be very large. It can be pretty difficult to analyze this because um, there's there are it's highly dependent on the heat transfer of the fluid in the pipe and the temperature probe itself and the flow rate that's going through it. Um, you know, if the, the flow is turbulent or laminar. Um, and fortunately, it, it can be uh, uh, the only real easy, quick and dirty test I know would be to um, put some insulation around the external portions of the temp sensor and see if the indicated temperature changes. Uh, we had an uh, inquiry from a customer a while back where they had kind of a mysterious problem. They'd had a process that had been running correctly, and all of a sudden one day it started reading a couple degrees C off. The temperature probe checked out okay. The whole control system was checked. Everything was fine. Um, and, and what it turned out to be is I, I had them wrap something around the external portions of the temp sensor and the temperature popped right back up to where it should be. So that, that really, uh, you know, it made sense that we, were, we had some stem conduction happening. Uh, and what, what way it turned out was that there was a fan that had been redirected and it was blowing right on that external portions of that temp sensor, causing the heat transfer to change a little bit and causing the measurement error. Uh, real simple solution there, but uh, they spent a lot of time trying to figure this out and just redirected the fan and the temp was back up to normal. So it can come from any number of places. That's why I say it's pretty difficult really to, uh, to analyze that and kind of quantify what that number is. Now for our um, example here, we have just two and a half inches of immersion on that thermal well um, with directly immersed sensors, ones that don't have a separable thermal well. 
just a little rule of thumb is if we take 10 times the sheath diameter and add the sensitive length of that platinum sensor, that's usually enough immersion, uh, at, at least in fluids, to give a good, accurate measurement and have very little effect by stem conduction. And there's lots of different probe designs and things that can be done to uh, help minimize it. We have a graph here that shows um, an assembly very similar to what we have in our pipeline. This is a, uh, a tapered thermal well um, with, with a platinum resistance thermometer inside. And if we look at the, the error, this is a, the, the error is expressed here as a percent of the delta T. So it's a percentage of the difference between the ambient conditions and the fluid that we're measuring. Now this, this assembly was slowly lowered into three different temperature fluids, an ice bath, 100 degrees C oil bath, and 200 degrees C oil. And they all track pretty close to uh, you know, the same, same errors. And if we get down here to about, uh, you know, here's our two and a half inch spot right here. And really we need to get closer to about four inches before most of that stem conduction error goes away with this type of, of an assembly. So back here at, at two and a half inches, we can, we can make a pretty good estimate of what our stem conduction is going to be. And I've, I've picked out 0.45 degrees C. So we can see our, our largest sources of error so far are the interchangeability and the, the installation error or the stem conduction. There's also errors associated with lead wires. Now, in our application, we have very short lead wires. They're, they're only a few inches long. They run from the temperature probe to a transmitter inside the connection head. So our our, um, we're, we're going to have essentially no lead wire error. <coughs> if you are running cable from that temperature probe back to a control room and it's only a three wire connection, there can be some significant um, errors come into play there. And for 18 gauge cable, and it, this is a, a worst case based off of, oh, I think it was some numbers that Belden had given me for their cable. And I look at the, the, uh, the difference in resistance between, uh, or, or the, the complete tolerance of resistance in their cable, because the, the three wire connection relies on all three of those leads having exactly the same resistance. And of course, they really don't. Um, so 0.16 degrees Fahrenheit per 100 feet. Uh, for some processes, yeah, not a big deal. Others, yeah, it could be pretty significant. And if you have a temperature probe made with an extension cable on it, uh, you really need to pay attention to the size of that cable temperature probe made with a 30 gauge cable and if it's made with a grade B or a class B interchangeability we can only get by with about four feet of cable on that and if we go much longer than that it's going to bump it out of that grade B tolerance band and as we increase the wire gauge uh, the the variation that we see in resistance of the cable is much less and here we, we get it by with 65 feet of cable for, for grade B and 36 for the grade A. Uh, the best way to get rid of all of this stuff is just to use a four wire connection or as in our example, have a transmitter right next to the temperature probe. The four wire circuit completely eliminates any lead wire error or errors due to a uh, maybe a corroded terminal on a terminal block or if you have a quick disconnect. Initially, quick disconnects work really well and all the pin and socket connections have pretty much the same uh, resistance in them, but as they age, you're gonna get some variation. And in a three wire system, you're going to induce an error. With a four wire, it's going to completely eliminate that error and, and take that out of any kind of an error um, source that you may need to consider. 
So plug in zero in our table. Next up is our transmitter accuracy. Um, and if you look at any transmitter specifications, you can probably notice that they can be very confusing and kind of difficult to figure out just exactly what kind of a number we should we should put in. You know, there there's um, you know this one has this EMC immunity influence and uh, you know whatever this is and temperature coefficients and all kinds of stuff. Usually there's some place on there that'll give you a kind of a general number for nominal conditions. And that's what I've used in our sample here, the 0.1 degree C. Is our connection head is at room temperature, you know, 25 degrees C. So most of those other errors really don't come into play. And then some of the other air sources with a uh, controller or PLC, if we're, we're running our signal back, they'll have some error value associated with them. And then also the calibration that was done to the temperature probe is going to have some potential error source with it also. And that's, um, you know, due to uh, uh, at the calibration lab where the probe was initially tested, and um, there, there's lots of sources there. Usually, the lab will publish some some number. In this case, it was uh, 0 0.025 degrees C was the uncertainty value for the uh, calibration that was done to the probe. You know, if, if this were a uh, calibration that was only done at say zero degrees C in an ice bath. You know, we probably have 0 0.005 degrees C because the ice bath is a really very accurate, very simple way to test the um, resistance of an RTD. But in our case, I'm going to kind of jump in ahead here a little bit, but we, we will have, have a full calibration on this temperature probe. And it's part of what we need to do to get our measurement accuracy within our half a degree C tolerance budget. So some of the other error sources here are radio frequency interference, electromagnetic. Um, again, they're going to be specific to the application. And you, you would typically want to do things to completely eliminate those because they can actually cause kind of an erratic reading of the temperature probe. Uh, if you cannot get rid of them, uh, it's going to be a real kind of a guess as to what kind of a value to plug in here. Um, and then the last four there that we would mentioned earlier, and these are going to be really specific to the application um, for what we're doing here. Uh, I'm not going to include any of these in our error budget. So we have all these different error sources. We've kind of gathered them. And now what do we do with them? Um, one of the easiest ways to combine these errors is using root sum square. And that'll give us um, a number. We take each one of those error sources, square it, add them together, and then take the square root. And then if you remember from the beginning of the uh, uh, presentation here, there are two numbers that we need to include in our uncertainty budget here. One of those is the plus minus tolerance and the other is your confidence level in this measurement. Now as you've noticed when we've been calculating all these error sources, uh, a lot of it has been uh, kind of an educated guess as to what that number might be. Um, and, and by using this coverage factor, it kind of takes some of that uncertainty out of it. And, and puts it into our, our equation here. So if we plug all of our numbers in here, um, we, we, we come up with this 0 0.713 degrees C, and then we plug in our coverage factor, and now we're almost uh, three times what our budget is of half a degree C. So now what do we do? Uh, fortunately, there are ways to make this better.
we could use a grade A PRT, platinum resistance thermometer. Um, that would cut our, our 0.523 number in half to 0.261. You know, and if you, if you plug that into the uh, root sum, you're, you're, we're still not going to get there. Uh, usually the trigger eye pull first is to match the sensor to the transmitter. And this requires a calibration of the temperature sensor. So it it will eliminate probably 85% of that PRT interchangeability. So we're getting rid of 85% of this number. And that's going to make a huge difference in our our um, our, our calculation. So we've we've gone from you know 0.5 something to 0 0.08. And the other big trigger to look at here was that installation error of stem conduction. Now there are there are some ways to eliminate this. We can use a different style of thermal well, uh, one that can give us a little more immersion length would typically be installing the thermal well in the run of a T, for example, was, is one way to do it. Uh, we could maybe eliminate the thermal well and go with a directly immersed sensor. That'll help minimize some of the stem conduction. Or we can put insulation around the outside uh, of the uh, process, you know, insulate the external portions of that temp sensor, and that's going to get rid of a big chunk of that 0.45. So if we do that, uh, we'll plug in some new numbers here, and we, we come up with uh, 0.195 degrees C, put our coverage factor on it, and here we're at 0.39 degrees C with our, our coverage factor, and that's well within our budget of half a degree C. And we even have a little room to spare there. So although the the cost to do calibration on a probe and to match it to the transmitter, it might be a couple hundred dollars, but it really does um, the, a, a really good job of improving the measurement accuracy, as well as looking at what the installation errors are. Something as simple as wrapping insulation around the outside of that sensor is, is very inexpensive and easy to do. Uh, there are applications where insulating materials may not be allowed because of clean room um, issues or other contamination. And, and there other solutions need to be looked at. And, and there are other solutions out there. So with that, um, I just want to wrap this up here. And then if there are any other questions, we can get to those. But um, really want you to take away from this is that Knowing that interchangeability number is not the accuracy. Uh, you, you can't look at a uh, spec sheet and say, okay, I've got this grade A platinum resistance thermometer and it says it's plus or minus 0 0.26 degrees C. Uh, you know, throw it in your process and say, oh yeah, that's that's all I need. We're we're good to go. There, that that's a very small part of it. You know, as we saw in our example, we we start out with that. I, we start out with a grade B, but it was already half a degree C without any other error sources involved. Um, so we need to look at all of those error sources, not only for the sensor, but also the installation. And we really need to know a lot of details about the installation to make some good educated guesses as to what the, what the magnitude of these errors are going to be. Uh, and then one of the best places is to consult with a manufacturer and, and see what they are, are going to uh, recommend. And then probably last on the list would be the, uh, the, the two standards. Uh, they do give us the interchangeability numbers and they talk about some insulation resistance and others. They're not really complete and they're not real stringent, but uh, it is a good basic source of some information. Um, I would pick the manufacturer's specs ahead of the uh, either one of the standards. So with that, um, <clears throat> anybody has any questions, we can throw those in the chat box now, or uh, you can certainly get a hold of me uh, later at the email address here. Give me a call, and um, can certainly help you.
step through or, or answer any uh, questions you may have about the uh, measurement accuracy. Okay, thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. Uh, it does look like we've got a, a few minutes for questions, and we do have a few questions. But as as Bill said, uh, if you've got a question, go ahead and type it into the chat or the Q and A section, uh, or go ahead and send an email to uh, to Bill after the session, and and we'll get get an answer for you. A um, couple uh, questions here, Bill. One was uh, I think one of the items that you had. Uh, up on the screen as as an air source was was vibration, and there was just a question about how does how does vibration impact accuracy of the of the sensor? What what what's kind of going on there? Well, when a uh, when a PRT is vibrating, there's a possibility that the platinum wires are moving slightly, and it doesn't take a whole lot of movement to cause some work hardening, and it can uh, affect the resistance of that wire, it typically would increase if, if you're in a vibration situation. Um, some of the, you know, you will see specifications for vibration. Uh, it's typically expressed as a shift in ice point resistance, uh, you know, over s some period of time. The, um, and, and it also applies to uh, either thin film or wire wound, mostly to the wire wounds. The thin film sensing elements are usually a little more resistant to vibration because it's uh, it's not a coil of platinum wire. It's just platinum that's deposited on a little uh, alumina substrate. But if you do have the coil type uh, sensing element, they are a little more sensitive and having those wires move around due to vibration or shock, either one, uh, can cause them to work harden, and it typically causes the resistance to increase. And again, these can be very small numbers, but uh, if it's a lot of vibration, you can go from, you know, the very small increase to an open circuit. So it could be anywhere in between there. Okay, great. Um, it looks like we've got another question here. I think you, you touched on this. Uh, maybe it was the, the previous slide as you were uh, kind of finishing up, and that is, uh, what determines which which standard I should follow? You know, there's the IEC, there's the ASTM, and I think you talked about probably maybe looking more at the manufacturer specifications. But um, how do you how do you determine which one if if you don't have something already in place, uh, which one you might want to use? Yeah, that really is just kind of personal preference. You know, I, the interchangeability numbers on the IEC are a little looser than the ASTM, um, but it, it, a lot of manufacturers exceed both of those tolerance bands. And, um, you know, I can think of three big instrument companies that all exceed those numbers anyway. So I would, um, I'd usually just look at the manufacturer specs. And if you need to put something in a standard, uh, it's just a personal preference. Okay, and then uh, maybe a somewhat related to that is is the uh, question regarding uh, class A and class B, and maybe you can talk a little bit about. Um, you know, so, sometimes manufacturers specify things a little bit differently. Sometimes they'll say the the sensor is class A. Other times they'll say manufactured with a class A element. Could you uh, talk a little bit about that and kind of what the differences of of that? Although it's only a slight change in language, I think it makes a significant difference in the in the accuracy you're going to get. Yeah, it, it really does, and you have to be a little bit careful there. Uh, there's a, some specsmanship going on there in some situations, uh, and this really comes into play mostly if you're if you're purchasing a probe that has an extension cable on it. Uh, you know, as you as you saw from our example with the uh, like a three wire circuit, that cable can have a pretty significant influence on the accuracy of that, or let me back up the interchangeability of that sensor. So. Um, you need to look at the specs very carefully and see if the probe was calibrated with that cable in place or if they're just saying that they started with a, you know, like a, a class A sensing element and then they add all this lead wire and do all the other stuff to it 
and it's going to change. It, 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 there's no way to do it without having it change a little bit. And you really need to make sure that they're doing that measurement from the very end of the cable where, of course, is where you're going to be attaching it to your instrumentation. Okay, couple. It looks like we've got a couple more questions. So if anybody uh, does have any other questions, go ahead and type them into the chat or the Q and A section. And just as a reminder, we will be sending out uh, session notes uh, as well as a link to the recording uh, after the session. So don't worry if you miss something or if you'd like to share it with uh, with someone. Uh, we'll go ahead and get you that that information, those links, so that you can you can pass it on. Um, looks like we've got two more questions at this point. One is, uh, if if your insulation resistance is going down, uh, is the sensor starting to fail? Yes. I guess I could say <laughs> yes to that. <laughs> um, you know, if you do check it each time that you do a calibration, and if you note that it is dropping, that's a good indication that uh, you know there's there's maybe the moisture seal has begun to fail. Um, it, it can be a little bit difficult to test too because uh, you know if you do have a part that where the moisture seal has failed and it's typically running in a hot process, that heat is actually going to keep the moisture out of it. But you pull it out to go calibrate it, you know maybe it sits on the bench for a day or two before you get around to it. It can pick up just humidity out of the room, you know, and depending on the time of year and the location in the country or wherever you are in the world, that can also have an influence on it. And, you know, it, it, it may be just fine in the process, but you test it on the bench and it's going to be low. It, it may not be failed, but it might be low. Uh, you know, so I, I, I guess if it, if it varies from what it was initially, then there might be some question maybe to watch it a little more closely. Certainly not, probably not a reason to uh, scrap it out and replace it, but just a, just a little kind of a yellow flag that says, watch this one. Okay, and then a, a question um, regarding Class A and matching. Is there any is there any benefit? I, I think you'd kind of talked about the matching of transmitters with with RTDs, and is there any benefit in upgrading to a Class A sensor uh, and then also matching that with a transmitter? No, not really. Um, both are going to have the same kind of performance, same repeatability, stability, everything like that. It just means that when the probe was built, or actually when the sensing element was built, uh, it was uh, trimmed just a little more closely to 100 degrees C. Uh, everything else, performance-wise, is the same. And as long as we're calibrating it, we're actually, you know, characterizing the resistance values of that probe. So uh, choosing a, a, a class A and then having it calibrated is pretty much just a, a waste of cash. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think that, that looks like it. It doesn't look like we've got any other questions. So I want to thank everyone for attending. We look forward to seeing you at, at future events. And again, as a reminder, we will be sending out session notes uh, within the next few days, and there will also be a link to the recording. So if you want to pass that along to folks, you certainly can. Uh, so with that, hope to see you next time. Uh, have a great afternoon.